This episode of the Planet Microcap podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856 830 one six six zero or email Neil Levine at N L E V I N E at Friedman LLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call eight five six eight three zero one six six zero or email Neil Levine at N L E V I N E at Friedman LLP.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Craft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. You're listening to episode 163. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. Save the date. As I've said numerous times now in a few episodes here, the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual is back and taking place April 20 through 22, 2021. The website is live. We actually just announced our initial speakers and sponsors. So I, I urge you to go and check out that lineup. It is all at our event website, which is www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. Registration is open. So when you're there, go click the register button and then you'll start getting access to the entire website. Everything's not open yet, like one-on-ones and stuff like that. That'll be opening up a little bit later. But for now, sign up so you can get all the new announcements and everything like that as soon as it happens. So uh, again, we're very excited about our upcoming event, Planet Microcap Showcase, www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com, April 20th through 22, 2021. See you all there. This week from the SNN Podcast Network, we have the following shows coming up. We got new episodes of In the Market Trenches with Gary Reby and Eric Fure and the Investors Roundtable on deck. First up, Gary and Eric welcome guest Dean Trattier uh, to chat about investing war stories. You know Dean, he's been on Planet Microcap, uh, has been a guest on uh, many shows on here. So this should be a really cool uh, conversation between Gary, Eric, and Dean. So check out this episode on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and Podbean at inthemarkettrenches.podbean.com. On the Investors Roundtable, our topic this week is the 2020 Berkshire Letter to Shareholders. Uh, We bring our expert panel of Buffettites uh, to chat about Berkshire's most recent letter. You can watch this episode on the SNN Network YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash SNNWire and listen to the audio version on the Planet Microcap podcast stream. The episode goes live about every Friday morning, so uh, look out for it there. Now, for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Dave Barr. He is the president, CEO, and portfolio manager at Pender Fund Capital Management. Dave recently did a phenomenal presentation at our last virtual event and thought it would be fun to continue that conversation of how he and the Pender Fund family identify multi-baggers. So thank you again for tuning in to episode 163 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my conversation with Dave Barr. Welcome 
back, everybody, to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And joining me right now is Dave Barr. He is the president, CEO, and portfolio manager at Pender Fund Capital Management. Dave, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Bobby? Great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. I'm just happy to be back in LA. All right. I told you <laughs> we're recording this on Friday <laughs> The, the 19th, and uh, I'm sure some people have heard of my, my little saga from uh, <laughs> getting out of getting out of Texas to here, but uh, yeah, it's been a week. Let's, let's quite the journey. Like quite, <laughs> quite a journey indeed. You know, I'm just thankful that my wife is an incredible driver in snow and sleet. I, I don't have as much experience, but she she's she's amazing. But uh, yeah, is she, is she Canadian? You know what? She might have some Canadian blood in her after what I just experienced. At the very least, I think if we may, if we moved to Vancouver or Winnipeg, we'd be okay. Um, <laughs> but you know, Dave, it's great to have you on here. You know, you just did a uh, a great keynote presentation for us at the uh, SNN Network Canada virtual event, and you know, I'll be asking you a couple questions a little bit later on. You know, on some of those things that you talked about in your presentation, as well as your background. We'll get into that, but. I figured we'd do our, our part, in, part, in, uh, uh, part of the interruption opening here in that, you know, get into some quick topics, uh, uh, you know, that are more timely today in that, you know, seeing the markets hit all-time highs uh, here in the U.S. I mean, since January or even, even maybe in the last year, I mean, have you been seeing some, some of the similar things happening up in Canada on TSX and CSE as well? Yeah, yeah, it's it's right across the board, and I think the trends we're seeing in the U.S. are totally consistent in Canada. Um, I mean, we've, we've had this period of time where there's a lot of people at home more, um, and I know you know the pandemic has had a twofold effect. There's there's people who are you know worse off um, as a result of this, but then there is a, a big cohort of the population um, where savings rates have increased quite dramatically, and it's interesting because it's it's actually. And we, you know, we see this with GameStop and Reddit and Wall Street Bets and all this. We, we, we've seen a, a big increase in individual participation in the markets. And I mean, I love being a part of your community. Where there's a lot of people like fil- searching through and looking for the, you know, the next big home run in the micro cap space. And I think there's there's a lot of factors at play right now. And I, you know, we've been we've been watching people go into ETFs for you know for over a decade now. Like this active to passive trend. It's been very predominant, you know, and what it's really doing, it's, it's been empowering the individual investor to uh, take control of their, their investment future. I mean, it's, it's simple, it's low cost indexing. Yeah, great. The, you know, what we're seeing now, though, is people have more time on their hands. And, you know, and like, I mean, you just have such great guests on this podcast, like you can learn, you can learn so much about investing on your podcast. And there's so many other great resources out there. So if you're sitting at home and you got five, six hours a day to burn, um, you can like get up to speed on buying individual stocks pretty quickly nowadays. So we're, we're kind of you know, like we, we've seen technology disrupt a whole bunch of industries. You know, I think you know, it started disrupting traditional finance with with ETFs and, and, and passive management. I think we're now seeing the second leg of that where, you know, actually being able to do research and buy companies and and, and get access to the data and the information the professionals have. It's, it's all right at everybody's fingertips right now. So it's the internet technology has been a great equalizer and layering that over with, you know, people having the time and the financial resources. We're just seeing a whole bunch of participation. You know, of course, there are people who are doing it right and people who are chasing returns. So, you know, we're, we're absolutely seeing some speculative mayhem out there. Um, but we're also seeing, you know, a lot of great opportunities, um, which is why markets are so great. Absolutely. But, you know, and one thing I've noticed, especially in Canadian markets, I'd say versus its, its U.S. counterparts. And this is a very broad stroke that I'm painting here. So uh, here we go. But I, I know, you know, OK. Anyways. But but the thing the, the thing that's interesting that I've seen, especially with Canadian names, is that those that would traditionally have been as seen as, you know, quality names, let's say revenue generating profitable, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> quality names, at least ones that, you know, at least just from a fundamental perspective, you'd say, all right, this is might be an investable name. Maybe it's a little, you know, maybe it's a hair expensive, but at least it has some of these other metrics going for them versus some of the U.S. names that have really taken off that may not have those similar types of, of metrics. Again, painting with a 
for a broad stroke. But I'd say in the in Canadian space, you've been seeing some of those names actually really starting to trade at, at much higher premiums um, than they otherwise would be. I mean, is, are, are you seeing some of those similar things? And is that good for the markets? Uh, I mean, or I bad. think they're, they're act, they, they, I mean, it, it, my, my favorite answer to all these questions is it depends. And, you know, I, what we are seeing in Canada is, you know, no revenue, um, no accountability, big dream, right? If, if you're selling a concept and a dream, um, you are going to attract an investor who's going to believe the dream. Um, you're not going to have fundamental people in there. So y- you have a good chance of attracting a very lofty valuation. Um, and we're we're absolutely seeing that. I mean, we're seeing companies with, you know, 500,000 of revenue and three and a half billion dollar market caps. I mean, does it, does it make sense to me? But, you know, that's, that's not my style. The, what we are, and then we're seeing, you know, there's the, 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 you know, the real businesses where, to your point, like, you know, growing revenue, profitable, increasing cash flow year over year. And, you know, in the last quarter, we've seen a lot of those companies start to catch a catch a bid and, you know, trade up on valuations. But, you know, there's still a big disconnect um, and a lot of inefficiency in how small and micro cap stocks are trading compared to large cap peers today. Interesting. I mean, why, why do you think that? Because, you know, if you look at Twitter, I mean, at least in our FinTweet community right now, you know, and listen, like every other tweet has been a great joke about like, you know, 2036, uh, uh, microcap is trading at 1 trillion and, uh, and or just, just joking. I'm, I'm totally yeah. misquoting, but like, you know, so what, what then, what's, what's, <laughs> what's going on? I mean, even for me covering microcaps, I mean, on a daily basis, I mean, we're, we're seeing some really incredible stuff, but still from your perspective and being the professional that you are, I mean, like what, what the, what's going on? You know, you say, you say that there's this gap, but is there? Yeah, because these things, like, a lot of these micro caps just aren't covered. And, you know, like I, a lot of like the, the other uh, individuals who run, run funds in, in Canada and across North America, I mean, if you're running a billion dollar fund, you're just, you're not looking at anything under, you know, two or $500 million market cap. So, you know, anything below that is really left to be picked over by a couple of hedge fund managers and micro cap managers. But there's not a lot of us who are like down in that part of the market. And, and then you get retail per individual and retail participation coming into it. So it's, you know, it's still, you know, there's, there's not enough of that capital to make that a totally efficient market. So, so you get those, you get those mispricings. I mean, right. what's, What's great, and what we what, what we what we've been seeing is once once these small micro cap stocks start to kind of you know get get a valuation which is more reflective, and you know as they get into the two hundred to five hundred million dollar market cap, then you start seeing the bigger funds coming in, and you're then you're seeing these things really take off. So when you kind of you look at some charts out there, and you know it was a twenty cent stock forever, and call it a 50 million market cap, and then it goes to a dollar, and all of a sudden it's $250 million market cap. You know, all of a sudden it's a five bucks because you got a bunch of funds buying it. And it's still, you know, they're they're comparing it to their large cap portfolio and they're like, hey, this is still cheap. And there's, you know, it's cheaper, better growth profile, longer runway, um, undiscovered, perfect. Let's load yeah. up, let's back up the truck. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, that was some good, that was some good current event stuff. You know, I, I appreciate all your takes there. So I want to take a step back because I think you kind of set the stage basically to say that there are, uh, and let me know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but, you know, you're basically saying there are still opportunities out there. and they're, 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 This market is still inefficient. So, you know, I want to take a step back so that we can, you know, see how you at Pender and, and your, your fund find some of these, you know, undiscovered opportunities. So before we get there, let, let's take a step back your background, you know, how did you get to, where did your passion for investing come from? You know, how did you get to where you're at today? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like every kid who's good in math and science uh, in high school, um, my, my career ambition was to be a doctor and ended up at university and, um, you know, quickly realized that wasn't my passion. And, um, but then, you know, started, you know, doing it, doing a degree in biology. I ended up going to the commerce building and picking up the the Financial Post, which was like kind of Canada's version of the, the Wall Street Journal um, back then. And so I'd be reading, you know, Financial, financial Post in the, uh, during my biology lectures. And, 
and then like started an investment club in university and uh, and always like kind of did entrepreneurial things in the summertime. So really like kind of got this business and investing focus. And then, so like after finish, finishing a sell by genetics degree, um, I was like, okay, what do I want to do? And I love investing, love technology. And uh, then I went, I was like, well, if I want to get into investing, I better, you know, get a basis in, in business. So I did a business degree in Toronto. Um, and really th- my focus then, and this is the late nineties was marrying kind of that tech background with, uh, with, with investing. And so then when, after my business degree came back to Vancouver and uh, started a career in venture capital. And I mean, it sounds sorry. Yeah, no, I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, at, as I said in your profile and your, in your bio that you, you, you would, would, I mean, really, would you say that your time working in private equity, what, like, why has it given you that unique perspective on investing? Because, you know, that it's, especially with micro caps, I mean, sometimes you're actually looking at companies that you're arguably be like, yeah, I probably should be a private company. But I mean, you know, from your perspective, why, why was it so unique to you? Yeah, well, I mean, it was, timing was a big part of it because this was like early 2000 and you know, basically you're ringing the bell on the NASDAQ to 5,200 and I'm starting in venture and I'm like, this is great. We're just going to find home runs all day long. I mean, it's, I, I mean, if you start your current venture right now, I mean, like, it's super, like how easy, this is easy, right? Like you just get performance, you get, look at companies and get paid performance fees. Um, you know, 2000, it was the complete opposite where, you know, all of a sudden there's cap financing dries up for tech businesses. Um, and it just became all about survival. So for me, having kind of that looking for, you know, companies that were going to be 10 X in value over a five to 10 year timeframe. Um, but then really having to focus in and saving a portfolio, you know, which of these companies are actually going to survive. Um, and you know, then when you, when you kind of go through it and then you step back and reflect on it, you know, it's the companies that were, you know, uh, had you know, decent revenues and revenues were growing. Um, they had cash flow. They had a decent balance sheet. And those were the things you didn't worry about. And what was really interesting is those were the companies that were then able to, you know, coming out of that really accelerate their growth because they were they were the survivors of the, you know, kind of, I, I talk about the, the, the financial market bubble, which, you know, impacts kind of company creation, formation, and, and also the, the, the bombs going off when the, the capital dries up. Um, so really, you know, like starting at that point in time, really enforced the, 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 the importance of business fundamentals. And, and also like when I was doing my business degree, I started reading about Buffett. So I was also like kind of reading Berkshire and or Buffett partnership and Berkshire annual letters and like figuring out all these different value investors and and then I mean, the, the light bulb went off, I think it was like 02, 03, where I read uh, Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits by Phil Fisher, which like, like if you're a full-time microcap investor, you need to read this book um, because he talks about his scuttlebutt due diligence. And when he's talking about that, I'm like, well, this is what I'm doing as a VC, looking at opportunities. Like I'm, you know, digging in on the company, the competitive landscape, you know, what, what, what what's their product roadmap look like? How are the margins? How big is the TAM that the company's going after? Can management actually do it? Um, have they done it before? Who are the other shareholders? It's like really doing that deep due diligence. And, you know, that's what Fisher really talked about in Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. And then running a concentrated portfolio, which VCs do. Having a long-term focus, which VCs do. So, you know, Phil Fisher was really uh, basically a venture capitalist, private equity investor um, looking at public companies. Because, you know, the added benefit of public companies is there's times when they're ridiculously cheap um, and there's times when they're ridiculously expensive. Um, so, you know, not only can you get the economics of the business over the long term, um, you can make some extra extra money along the way trading these things a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, so then, OK, so then to catch us up, you you then <laughs> so you're, you're working at venture capital. And then at the I think it was at the end of 2007, you became partner at Pender Fund. Man, you're you're picking your timing. It's just perfect from from career switches, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know what what led to you then becoming partner at Pender Fund and, and leaving you know this private equity venture venture fund that you work at? Yeah. So between kind of early two thousands to two thousand seven, when I came on as full a full partner, it uh, we we'd done really well 
in the public markets. And I'd been developing a bit of a track record, not, not something you could ever point to. Um, but, you know, we were sitting there in the venture space and there's so much money chasing the private companies and, and a lot of super smart investors who knew the companies really well. And, but then in the public markets, because of kind of what happened in 99, 2000, there's all these technology businesses that were totally stranded and they were totally out of favor. But, but CEOs were forced to, you know, focus on building their business. Like there was no capital available to them. So they ended up starting to build these, you know, great businesses in the public markets that just nobody understood. So we started to get really, uh, really aggressive buying stocks in, 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 the, in the public markets, you know, companies market caps between 10 and $100 million. And um, it was it was a wonderful opportunity set. So when I, you know, in, in the end of end of 07, um, I really, I came on um, with the idea of launching a small cap hedge fund to really focus on that part of the market. And then you know, obviously, you know, as, as we, we start going down the path in 2008 um, and it was like, well, this is interesting. Um, and then, you know, as 2008, like as, you know, as the financial crisis rolled out by the end of 08, we were like, okay, like if we're going to do this, this is the best possible time ever to, to launch a fund. And uh, we finally got launched in uh, June of June of 2009. Um, but it was, I mean, it, it's, you know, people look back and like, you're, you sure got lucky. And I can tell you at the time, nobody was saying we were lucky. Like people, I tell people we were launching a fund in June of 09. And you're getting that all oh, good for you. Like they're giving you the full on crazy eyes, right? Like, so I, I always, I always joke. I'm like, we're somewhere between lucky and crazy. Um, let you decide. I mean, what were you seeing? I mean, we, you know, I'm sure, you know, we could probably go back and just my catalog of episodes and talk about, you know, stories that people had from those times. But I mean, what were some of the craziest opportunities that you saw during that time when you were like, all right, this, these, these are, so, this is such undervalued stuff right here. Like we need to have the fund in order to us, for us to take even more advantage of this. You know, what, what were some of the things that you were seeing? Well, we are, you, you were seeing on micro cap stocks and, you know, they're, you know, trading with trading below their cash value in, in terms of market cap. So negative enterprise value and businesses that were highly profitable and growing at, you know, double digits year over year. So you're basically, you're getting the business for free um, with, basically zero downside risk. So, I mean, that was just a, a target, target rich environment. And this was, it was, it was right across the board. Um, the, so it was, uh, th those were fun times. And it was like, there, we had a similar setup in kind of 03, 04, 05 timeframe as well. Um, and, you know, similarly, we saw that again last March, April. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, last March, April, we saw that, you know, I mean, it was very quickly. Um, very yeah. things, things move back very fast. You know, I mean, I was going to say, I mean, does, does it seem like there is another opportunity for that? Like what the setup for that happening again? I mean, I, I just don't know if there's going to be any of these like elongated bear markets. I mean, I'm sure there, there might be at some point, you know, but who, who knows? I mean, that was the fastest flash crash recovery, you know, in the history of, of our time, you know, it, it seemed like, is it just going to be more of those or, will we see something a little bit longer so that we can take advantage of more of the, you know, that setup that, as you're talking about? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we don't know what it's going to be, but you know, we're going to have a crash again. Um, and you know, the, it'll, it'll be different, but it'll, there'll be a whole bunch of, whole bunch of things that rhyme. And I think what we've seen as central banks and the fed in particular, they, they fine tune their, you know, they, they built and fine tune their playbook in the financial crisis and, and they rolled it out really quickly last year. And, but you know, what, what's interesting is, you know, and we saw this in the performance of our funds, um, you know, like mega cap stocks, investment grade debt, like all this stuff snapped back pretty quickly. Small and micro cap, like there wasn't a whole lot of moving until like really Q4 of last year. So, you know, you're sitting there from the end of March to well into the fall. I mean, you had six months to deploy capital where you were setting yourself up very nicely for the next five, 10, 20 years. So um, when I think when we see these market dislocations, um, you know, like you generally have more time in the micro cap, small cap space, because as risk appetite comes back into the market, um, you get the big pools of capital going into the liquid solid stuff. And then, you know, as risk appetite increases, 
Um, people come down into to our part of the market. Um, can have another conversation about the riskiness of micro cap stocks if you want, but you know, people people don't do a very good job of assessing risk. Fair enough. No, we'll get we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, so I wanted to now harken back to you know yesteryear, and by yesteryear I mean like maybe less than two months ago when you uh, you gave that that great keynote at our virtual um, at the SNN Network Canada virtual event. The title of that talk was Pender's Approach to Microcap Investing Looking for Multibaggers. Now, you know, you lied to my audience a little bit, you know, because you weren't just talking multibaggers. You're really talking about 100 baggers here, okay? That was the next, like, two slides. I was talking about 100 baggers. Um, so, so I have to ask, you know, where, in your opinion, looking at the markets either right now, you know, yeah, right now, I guess I'd say, you know, where, where can they be found? And then, for you, what do you look for when you're looking for 100 baggers out there? Not just multi baggers, 100 baggers. <laughs> Compliance won't let me say 100 baggers, so I'll just keep on saying multi baggers. Fair enough. Done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. So, I, I, what's, I, what's great, you know, you, you look at the book, um, both 100 baggers and 100 to 1 in the, in the stock market by Phelps. And, you know, basically every year there is a stock available that goes, that is a hundred bagger over an extended period of time. Um, so there's always a stock to be found. And, you know, what, what we, like there's some, there's some common themes and, you know, principles of, of where you should be looking. And, you know, you're, you're more likely to find them in the micro cap and small cap space. I mean, Facebook might be a hundred bagger from here. Um, maybe. Like higher probability of, you know, something smaller, right? Like it's just, you get too big, it's harder to do. Not, not that you're not a great company and whatnot. So you're looking for micro cap stocks. Um, the other thing is like looking for, you know, you know there, there has to be, there has to be some sort of valuation disconnect. So it's got a, you know, and micro cap stocks are great because that market is traditionally inefficient. So understanding when the stock is cheap relative to its intrinsic value. Um, but then you need to be, you know, focused on, you know, business quality and runway. So they need to be able to generate, you know, increment, strong incremental free cash flow for a really long period of time while they're growing. And if they can continue to reinvest and do that, um, you know, you're probably probably off to the races. And then you, know, you also need a, an aligned management team and shareholder structure. I mean, I think we, we've had a lot of, lot of multi-baggers, which were short-circuited on their way to 100 baggers because somebody just came along and bought them. Um, so that's, you know, you've, you have to have shareholders and management that are aligned for the aligned for the long term to actually get it. Because you do have to hold it for, you know, if you're lucky, if hundred bagger ten years is phenomenal, but you got to hold it for 20, 30, even forty years for the the magic to really happen. Absolutely. I mean, what what would you say makes you and, and Pender Fund, you know, unique compared to some of the other funds that are out there that are also? I mean, I think every fund would say they're looking for multi bagger opportunities, right? But you know, what, what, what would you guys what would you guys say makes you unique in in picking some of these names? I mean, that you know, you talked about in that presentation. I, I believe you talked about. I'm pretty sure you talked about in that presentation um, that we're able to find some of those companies earlier than than others. Yeah, I, I mean, we all like to think we're unique. Uh, I mean, there is a ton of smart people. Um, doing exactly what I'm doing, and they're and they're doing it better than me. So I mean, to say to say we're unique, I'm that, that's just like way too uh, not. True. All right, fine, different. It, How about that? Yeah. So, but I, you know, <laughs> the the majority, uh, like majority of professional managers, just they can't invest that down where we are. Um, and it's kind of it's incentives of the industry, right? When you're when you're compensated on your assets under management, you want to grow your assets. So even if you're really good and successful in microcap, then you can, you know, what we see happen time and time again is, you know, people build great track records and, you know, then all of a sudden like tons of assets fly in the door and they get really big and then they can't actually be in the space anymore. Um, and some investors can evolve their process and continue to generate strong returns. Um, but it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the, the really good people who are doing it in microcap um, they, they don't grow it pretty quickly unless, you know, they're, they're, they're disciplined and, you know, either give capital back or cap their funds. And, you know, when, you know, in 2015, when we were seeing a shortage of opportunities in the market, we, we capped our fund. And I, you know, as at, at Pender, I mean, what, you know, I'm the largest shareholder and CEO and, 
you know, what we, what we love doing is coming to work every day and finding the next great stock. Like we're, we're investors. Like that's what we like get really excited to do. And, you know, like I like actually talking to other really awesome investors. So we're cre- we've created this environment where people just come in and looking for stocks all day. And this, it's not about asset growth. It's about investing the right, the right way and investing the fender way. So just creating that environment for managers, analysts to be, uh, be at Pender um, and deploy capital where where they can um, to add value to portfolios. And for me, like that, that's in the micro cap, small cap space. Um, I, I'm not going to add any value buying Facebook. I got people on our team who love doing that stuff and they're really good at it. Um, good for them. Really <laughs> okay. Very cool. I mean, you know, so Dave, you know, looking at the micro cap space right now, you know me on, you know, you've listened to my show. You know, I don't ask about individual names or anything like that, you know, but what sectors have you been seeing that are still maybe just getting overlooked right now? You know, I mean, I don't think I've heard a peep out of oil in the last like year or, you know, I mean, because when we think about microcap investors, you inherently think I want to be a contrarian. So, I mean, why not? Why not go there? What, what are some of the things that are just completely quiet right now? Yeah, I, I mean, the resource side has been really challenging for quite a while and in Canada and around the world. And um, I mean, it's not, you know, when you're looking for multi-baggers, um, you're, not, you're, not, you're not usually gonna find that in the resource space over the long term um, because you need high quality businesses. And um, you know, I'm just defending so many Canadian CEOs right now and I apologize, um, but your business is dependent on the price of the underlying resource. And you, you know, which, which inherently you're a commoditized company, uh, you can't be differentiated. It's really hard. There are some exceptions. I mean, we have a we have a you know one particular investment in the energy space where we got a management team that's on you know project like project number four is the fourth time they've been at it. Every time they've de- delivered like great double digit IRRs to to investors. They buy tons of their own stock. They're contrarian thinking. Um, so like that's that's a great place for us to be. But it's it's generally a challenging space. So, you know, for us looking for places with, you know, you look for places with big TAMs um, that are currently out of favor. And the best place to go looking is actually in, you know, the bubbles that were three or five or 10 years ago. And I mean, I remember kind of like 20, 2016, 2017, um, where like cannabis stocks were super popular. And I'm like, okay, these are great. Um, there's a ton of capital being raised. There's companies being formed. I mean, this is 1999 for tech stocks. And, you know, there's going to be some great businesses that come out of this. There's going to be a ton of like, you know, blown up portfolios as a result. Um, but, you know, so, you know, we've had that bubble. It totally came off. There's a bunch of restructuring. So there's, there's some interesting opportunities in that space right now. And then the other area is, I, I mean, is, uh, is crypto. And we saw, you know, a big, uh, you know, uh, financing bubble a few years ago in, in cryptocurrency here in Canada. And, you know, as a bunch of companies raised capital and, you know, it all kind of fell by the wayside for a while. And, but now, you know, we're, we're seeing some real businesses emerge. Um, we're seeing more positive fun, more positive momentum in, in various crypto markets. Um, so there's, there's some interesting opportunities there as well. I mean, what, what, what do you think, in your opinion, caused some of the change where some of these, you know, bubbles of five, three to five years ago are now make, making, making a comeback right now? You know, it was funny. You said that literally the first thing I thought of was cannabis. When, when you said 2016, 2017, I was like, I was like, oh, you're talking cannabis right now. Because that, that crashed and burned hard back then, you know. Yeah. Um, but so in your opinion, why are cannabis crypto now taking center stage again? Yeah. So, what, I mean, the... When you, when you look at what's necessary for these capital raising and financing bubbles to occur, the underlying, the underlying premise that you need is you need a new, a new way of doing things, a new product or a new industry that could be massive, right? You need, so you need this, like, this, this new shiny object with this big, massive town. And you know, what, what, what generally happens is people get really excited in the early stages and then there's this period of time where you're actually, you're running a real business and running businesses is really hard. 
and like bad, bad things just happen to you almost all the time. Um, and you're just, you're fighting fires and, you know, so that the, the kind of the shine comes off the bubble and that's, you, you know, kind of reality sets in um, and then businesses start to trade. And I wouldn't say on fundamentals. It's because what happens is you lose all the, the excited idea investors because you're the stocks crashed and then these stocks get stranded for a while. But and then you get, you know, as like with the tech bubble in the late 90s, you know, you had all these companies financed. And then in the early 2000s, you had the CEOs who figured it out and built great businesses. And so what we see in the markets today is there's cannabis companies that are doing things the right way and building businesses. It's crypto current companies that are, you know, uh, you know fig- figuring, like have f- figured out their business models and are building real businesses. So it's, you start getting that groundswell of fundamental investor coming into it. Um, and then there's a, a lot of times you can get a secondary, you know, bubble going because, you know, that big idea is still there. It's still super exciting. It's still early on. Um, so you can get a lot of, uh, you know, you can get the speculators and the momentum guys coming in as well and, and, re- and driving prices up again. Very cool. All right. Well, Dave, I want to go to story time now, because as you said, you know, you've been through a few of these, these market cycles now, you know, back in the early 2000s, 2008 GFC, you know, now this, the flash crash of 2020, right? Is that what we're calling it? The flash crash of 2020? You know, uh, what, what would you say is an investor, uh, an investing experience that has impacted you the most in your career? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I would just go right back to starting um, in, uh, in venture. And, you know, one of the, one of the first investments I was heavily involved in is actually, you know, we, we had them at your, uh, at the conference, uh, Tantalus, and uh, we're a shareholder of Tantalus, and we were a shareholder in 2000, and, you know, it was a pre-revenue company at that point in time, and, you know, it was, we were, you know, the company was trying to raise capital month to month to keep the lights on, and, you know, we were helping them raise capital, and, like, it was, this oh, was kind of oh one and I mean it was just it was hard and I remember yeah Keith Martin uh, C, founder CEO of the company um, who's one of the highest quality people I've I've met um, he's I think he's head of Boy Scouts Canada um, you know doesn't get any doesn't get any better than that and you know we, we there was a board meeting where we were you know we we're basically voting to we we're talking about shutting down the company and Keith's like no I think we're going to be able to raise the capital and he took a second mortgage on his house. And I, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell this story or not, um, but he saved the company. And, you know, really when you, you know, going through, like trying to keep a company alive and the determination and grit needed by founders and the management team, like that whole management team just totally rallied. And, you know, as a result, um, you know, now we got, you know, Tantalus is you know, like $50 million revenue company growing nicely and, you know, now trading nicely on the, on the TSX and the, but like that was just like such a, a real world business building experience. And I think, you know, when you start off in your career, you can be very, you know, focused on numbers and spreadsheets. And I mean, just you know, throw a lot of stuff out the window. Like that was a real lesson in, in building businesses and just, yeah, very, very impactful in the way I, I invest today. Wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. You know, I mean, I, just what what a story um i don't, I don't think i've told that story publicly before um, <laughs> you know, i've, I've I told mean, it i've told it to people in private but not uh, not in a forum yeah. like this well you know look you, it worked out it worked out for the good right so i mean I, i'm sure i'm sure i'm, I'm sure keith, keith right keith, yeah. I, 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 i'm sure he would probably be proud to say yeah no look, we had to do what we had to do you know and uh, um I mean, how about, how about, do you have a recent story even like with the GF from, uh, from the flash crash, you know, what was something, was there something that you took away from that experience that you're like, okay, this is something that I can think about. Cause what if something like this happens again, where it's another flash crash, you know, kind of thing. So is, was there anything that happened during that time that you're like, Oh, that, I could learn from that. Yeah. I, you know, it, we were, we, we were, I mean, it was, that was a challenging one because, you know, we had, you know, it, there was this added layer of complexity when looking at investments because it was such, such a highly emotional environment because, you know, not only are you watching portfolios go down, you know, you're thinking about, you know, oh my gosh, am I or my loved ones going to die? 
so there was this there was this added layer of emotional um, decision making that, that came into to bear, and I, I think that actually created a, a you know increased the volatility we experienced because I mean if, if you think of you know the, the world today I mean we're still in this environment where you know I imagine the majority of the world's capital is run by sixty year old white guys and. I mean, if you're looking at the data on, you know, death rates and COVID early on, you didn't want to be a 60 year old white guy. So there's, there's a lot of fear. So you got, you know, people controlling the purse strings of financial markets were really scared. And you could kind of see that. I mean, like, gosh, like down 13% one day, like it was, it was, it was insane. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was interesting just watching the emotion, the emotional response parlay into market moves. Um, you know, it was, I, what, what, what was really reinforced in that period of time is, you know, we've got, and Felix, my partner has written a blog about this, you know, what to do in a crisis. And like, rule number one is don't do anything. Cause you know, you're, 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 you're just, you're, you're emotional, your decision making's impaired. Just don't do anything. Um, but then we'll, but then the next, second thing is, well, make sure you, you shouldn't do it. Make sure you, you shouldn't do nothing. So it's like, then start looking at your portfolio and, I mean, I think every kind of, you know, financial crisis, flash crash, tech bubble, like every major market correction is different. The fact patterns are always different. So, you know, then you have to go into your portfolio and evaluate, you know, what, you know, is, is the intrinsic value of your business really impaired? Um, and, you know, if it is, I mean, you better move, move out of that really quickly. What, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the really interesting layer is like, you know, we were sitting there and we're like, okay, where is the intrinsic value gone down? And then as we're looking at some of our companies, we're like, well, intrinsic value has actually gone up because these products are e- even more demand. And I think uh, Satyan, the CEO of Microsoft came out and I think the, his quote was, we just saw two years of demand pulled forward, uh, two years, of ca- like, right? And so a lot of these companies had cash flow pulled forward. So here we are in the middle of a crisis and everyone's panicking. And the intrinsic value of our companies is actually going up, even though the like market were, were off fifty percent in market price. So I mean that was that was really in, that that was really intriguing from our perspective, and you know we hadn't actually seen that in in one of the prior prior environments, which was which was really interesting. Very cool. All right, well, Dave, we're rounding the bend here. You know, I, again, thank you so much for for spending your time with us today. So. What would you say if, if you had to give advice for new investors that are looking at the stock market today? You know, what, what are some of the things that you would give them? Yeah, yeah I mean, as, as you start to get involved in the markets, you know, the, the safest way to do it and, you know, the best way for a lot of people is just buying a passive ETF. Um, you know, if you're a total investment nerd like me and you just want to read about this stuff and think about it all the time, um, you know, it's find, find some people who, you know, have successful long-term track records, um, figure out what they do, um, and don't copy them and figure out what works for you. So, you know, take tidbits from everybody, figure out what works for you, and then focus on businesses, you know, and understand. So, you know, if you've, if you've been running HVAC companies your whole life, um, there's a whole bunch of companies in that space, suppliers to that industry, customers, where you're going to have some insights that a lot of uh, a lot of professionals don't have. Um, so, and I think when when you when you understand the business and you you get the numbers right, I think you know some of the most successful investors I've seen and I talked to today are are individuals who have just compounded their internal investment portfolios at massive rates. Um, because they've done exactly that, um, you know, taken parts of successful investors, uh, applied it in their own way to businesses they really understand. Very good. Well, with that, Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can my audience go and find everything they need to know to follow you, Pender Fund, as well as listen to your podcast? I don't know if people knew, but you got a podcast on it. That's really quite great. Yeah, yeah, not as prolific as yours though, but we, we do we do comment every now and again. Um, our our website is uh, www.penderfund.com. Um, you can also follow me. I'm at Pender Dave on Twitter, and um, you know I'm a good company man, so I 
I try to share all our information as well as the occasional insight into the micro cap, small cap market. Very cool. Dave, thank you so much. This is a lot of fun. Again, good luck, stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. Thanks, Bobby. Glad you made it back from uh, Austin so that we could do this. Oh, man. Me too. <laughs> it would, it would, leave it at that. Thanks, man. <laughs> Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. This episode of the Planet Microcap Podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman Partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com.